I am opening my Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, and I am beginning with verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 down to verse 18. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. I want to draw out of this text two things especially. And they come from verses 12 and verse 13. Verse 11 reminds us of what we have heard repeatedly, that there were priests through the centuries who had stood ministering according to the Mosaic Law, and repeatedly they had offered sacrifices which didn't seem to have any ending to them. They would stand and time after time, the same sacrifices were offered and they became mighty good at the whole process, I'm sure. I'm sure that if they stood there and needed a nap, they could have taken it on their feet while their hands and their lips would have continued to go through the motions the contrast is once again held out very plainly for us that there is a difference between our high priest and all of the priests who have gone before. Every priest stands daily. They do not have a place at work to sit down because their work is never completed, there is always more to do, and so there is no break during their working hours. Those priests, they were standing on their feet and continually offering, time after time, the same sacrifices which never took away sin, but rather emphasized the fact that those who were offering the sacrifices were sinful, that they were sinners. As we have seen before, the sacrifices themselves were emphasizing to the people, you are sinful. And that was the emphasis made. The first two verses of, the first two words rather, of verse 12, but he, but he. I wonder if 10,000 and 100,000 years from now, in glory, if we will not be amazed at how dull we are about who he is, what he did for us, Many times we have looked to the Scriptures and we have identified Bible characters and we have wondered because of how close they were to miraculous events, how close they were even to the Lord Jesus Christ, or 
theophanies which happened in Old Testament times, angelic visitations, how we have wondered and how we have perhaps lacked a measure of charity in pointing to these individuals and saying, how in the world could they not see what was straight ahead of them? How could they possibly be so dull, so stiff-necked, so thick-skinned? Describe it as however you wish, but is it not true of us? Is it not also true of us? Those things that we have received, the blessings upon blessings that we have received, the Spirit of God who has come to take the things of Christ and to make them so vibrantly real to us, will we not, so many thousands of years moving forward, look back and wonder, not at others, but wonder at ourselves? Let me highlight for you once again this contrast this dramatic contrast which the writer continues to push at us and emphasize to us and will not let us escape it, that there was such a contrast, such a drama taking place, it was as, as radical as right and left, as radical as night and day, as radical as rags and riches, when He, but He, Jesus Christ, most certainly when we are in glory, we will consider in a new way. We will look at Him and we will think back how that He left that place of glory and that He came down into this world how that he was born of peasant parents, and how that certainly by some he was likely regarded as the bastard son of those who had violated the rules of morality. And he was born in Bethlehem, no special place except that that was the city of King David, or rather the village of David's family and to be raised in Nazareth after having escaped to Egypt for a time, coming back to be raised in the carpenter's shop and there himself to use those implements for a time, then to gather around him that band of disciples, none of them special, none of them having the accolades of this world, Maybe Matthew, a little higher than the others, maybe he had some talent that this world would have appreciated, but the rest, who were they? And so certainly even as Jesus had been belittled and scorned and mocked in other ways, undoubtedly one look at his disciples and someone would assess, is that the best that this rabbi could gather around him. And Jesus, for a time, he gathered such great crowds of people. They, they were stepping on one another, but after some months, the crowds thinned, and then they thinned some more. And Jesus finally taken in Jerusalem to be crucified. And Jesus even in His glorious resurrection, those who didn't believe it, those who desperately wanted some other explanation to satisfy curious minds. So we have all of those priests who have come, all of those who have sought to do their best, but He, but He, and there is a difference that takes place here. And the explanation is that this One who has come from heaven's glories 
who has come to live the life which he did live and to receive that scorn, to receive all of the belittling that people so eagerly lumped upon him. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus, who came unlike those other priests, and offering the sacrifice that none of them could ever offer. And only that one time, please be patient with me lest I harp on this, that all of those sacrifices, somewhere in the records of heaven, we'll be able to find out exactly how many sacrifices there had been offered we are told that the Kidron Valley with the little brook in the bottom, that it constantly ran red because of the number of sacrifices that were offered in the temple right alongside of it. There was a constant flow of blood that was drained out of the animals, some of it offered and others just sent down the side of the hill. But Jesus, but Jesus, what a difference there is made here when He offered one sacrifice because the blood was of such a radically different character from a radically different one that was being sacrificed. One sacrifice for sins and it was done. It was done and there was no more. He sat down at the right hand of God. Again, those other priests, there were no chairs around where they were to sit because they continued in their work. But Jesus, our great high priest, He is the one who does sit down in that place of honor. You remember James and John coming to Jesus and they said that they wanted to have those choice seats of privilege in His kingdom. One on the right and one on the left. They wanted to be right where the action was. Here Jesus comes and He sits down in the place of honor at the right hand of His heavenly Father. But now I come, having highlighted the person of Jesus, I want to highlight what is taking place now as He has sat down where no one else was worthy to sit down. That was not for any archangel. That was for Him alone, having done what He alone could do. Having sat down at the right hand of God, we then come to a word, waiting. Waiting. I have never yet met a person who has said, of all things in this world, I excel at waiting. I think it would certainly be a very arrogant person. My father-in-law is a man for all of his stellar qualities who does not excel at waiting. He gave me some counsel many years ago. On numerous occasions, I would guide my old Chevy west along Roblin Boulevard, and at Elmvale, I would turn right and find, I didn't need to look hard, I knew where it was, 55 Elmvale. And I would march up to the door and hit the doorbell, and I was looking for Charlene to come out on a date with me, and I would be brought in. I tell you, I was always punctual. I was always looking at my watch, 
and gauging exactly. If I needed to, I would wait just down the street so that I could pull up onto the driveway at exactly the right moment. This was not pleasing to Charlene because she was never ready. And so I would be brought in to stand in the little entryway and I would wait. Sometimes my, fa my father-in-law-to-be would come and he would give me a bit of counsel. He would say, and this is a man who had three daughters, he would say, Jim, you will spend most of your life waiting on women. Now, I give that to you not as what I personally believe, but simply as a report of what he told me long time ago. It's our collective experience to wait. To wait. Think back in the Bible. Noah, there on the ark, he was waiting for the water to go down so that they could be released and go and see what this new world was. We think of Abraham and we think of Sarah whose biological clocks weren't just ticking, they had essentially stopped and they are yet waiting for the promised son to be born, the heir to come. We think of the children of Israel down in Egypt. Joseph, you recall, had told them, you are to put my body into a coffin. You are not to bury me, but you are to place me into a coffin because God is going to visit you and I want to be a part of what God is going to do among you and you are to take my bones with you. And the children of Israel waited. And the decades went by and even the centuries and 400 years finally God sends Moses, the most unlikely candidate, to be the one to lead them out of Egypt. They had waited. They come. And they are in the wilderness. And once again, they are waiting. What are they waiting for? God had told them that all of the adults were to drop in the wilderness. It's rather grisly, but they were waiting for the last adult who emerged out of Egypt, aside from the two, they were waiting for that last funeral to take place before they could enter the land. They come into the land and God had warned them that they were to stay true to His Word. But it comes to the Babylonian exile and again they are sent away from the land and they are waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of God. Now over all of this, there is the promise of Messiah. And over all of this, there is the waiting for Messiah to come. And of course, we see that Jesus, the Messiah, has come, but yet Jews continue to wait and look and long. Jesus has come. There was the waiting of ten days for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And now there is the waiting of Jesus not to come as the Messiah, as our sacrifice, but the One who will come and rule and reign in power. Of course, within our own lives, there are all kinds of things for which we wait. But lest we think we are outstripping or that we are going before the Lord, I want to highlight to you that the Lord does not ask of us that which He Himself does not do. We love Him because He first loved us. 
we are called to be givers because of the lavish, most generous, abundant gifts that God has given to us. What is Jesus doing even there in heaven, seated beside His heavenly Father? Of course, we know that He has sent the Holy Spirit and we know that He is preparing a place for us But see the word that is used here, that he is waiting. Waiting from that time when he offered that sacrifice and sat down at the right hand of God, he is now waiting and anticipating, looking and longing, even as we are looking and longing for that great climax and that wrap-up of time waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. The book of Hebrews primarily holds out Jesus as the one who has come and the one in whom we rightly place our confidence. For those who first of all read these these pages, they were considering that perhaps Jesus was not all that they originally thought he was cracked up to be. Maybe they had been misled. Maybe they had been wrong. And the word is no, absolutely not. Jesus outshines everything of this world and he is the one in whom our confidence is rightly placed. But as we draw towards the end, It is not simply all in the past what God has done in Christ. It is looking and pointing us to the future. There will come a day when all His enemies are made a footstool for His feet. There are two ways in which enemies may be made a footstool. First of all, and I think that our thoughts immediately go to this, there is the eradication, there is the elimination of those enemies and their eternal destiny. However, there are enemies such as Saul of Tarsus, who God looked down upon in such grace and in such kindness and said, yes, I know that this one is a vehement opposer. He is one who has beaten Christians and even taken them to their death. But I will show my mercy, I will show my grace to such a one as this. And he shall be one who comes before me and who catches a glimpse of who I am in all of my glory. And he shall bow at my feet, and I shall extend the scepter even as the king in Esther extended the scepter and grace, and Esther was permitted to live. For by one offering, we read verse 14, one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. Here we have not just the Son of God who has done such things, but the Holy Spirit, the one who was sent to take the things and to push them before us that we might see them anew. The Holy Spirit takes the stand and bears witness to Christ. This is the covenant that I will make with them After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. There won't need to be parchment or books in hand. People will be a living Bible. There will be an indelible imprint upon these hearts. And hear this as well, verse 17, and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. There is nothing 
more horrible than the memory of God. Have you ever met a person and someone says, this fellow, he's got a photographic memory. Well, as good as anyone's memory is in this world, you know, those annoying people in school who they could just sort of page through a book and you could ask them some questions and it was all there all of a sudden. How annoying. But here, God's memory supersedes anything of this world. He is omniscient. He knows it all. And there is nothing more fearful than for someone to consider. He knows absolutely everything that I have done. But there is nothing more glorious than the promise of God that He will wipe the slate clean. And that the hard drive, there will be no tech that could ever get back what has been burnt off of there. It will be gone absolutely. Their sins and their lawless deeds, all of their transgression and rebellion, God says, I will remember no more. Is there any greater God than our God? There is no one like Jesus, lest anyone think that he's just sort of one of the gang. Looks at the collection of rabbis from long ago, or looks at the disciples that Jesus hung out with and say, he's just one of the gang. Or in a wider means, there's Confucius and there's Buddha and there's the gods of Greek and the Roman pantheon and there is lots of options. There is none like unto Jesus Christ. And there is none who comes in the power and with the promises of God that He shall accomplish all that He has set out to do. And how can we not rejoice in such a Savior as what we have and in a great High Priest that is our very own? Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the privilege of gathering to consider once again what we have in Christ and all that you have come to do and that even as we wait, you are also waiting and looking and longing and anticipating that great day. Oh Lord, how we rejoice in you. So work in our hearts and open our eyes again to see such wonderful things of who you are and what you have done on our behalf. And let us praise you all the more and live lives that are pleasing before you, lives of confident faith in you and in your word. So work in our hearts, we ask, in Jesus' name, amen.